Hi, my name is Luis, and this is the image colorization using convolutional neural networks project. Um, so a bit of background first, I guess, in an introduction is uh, image colorization is mainly done on old black and white media, uh, mostly for artistic uh, or aesthetic purposes. Um, so, however, this can be fairly labor intensive and tedious to do by hand. Um, and neural networks are actually a great way to speed this up and do it automatically. This is especially worthwhile for footage where it's 24 frames a second in black and white that you want to colorize. Um, and automating it using neural networks is a great way to make this task easier and more widely available. Um, yeah, so our inspiration for this project was uh, our DAO's webpage. Uh, where he has a bunch of pictures that he posted and colorized using a neural network. So these are a few of his examples. So you can see on the left is the black and white picture he fed into the neural network. Um, on the right we have the ground truth, and in the middle is his colorizations. Uh, so you can see they're not perfect. You can see like patchiness of uncolorized still black and white pictures, but they're actually pretty good. Um, the leopard actually looks like the leopard, and the grass is actually picked up to be green, and the trees, um, yeah. Um, another of our inspirations was a paper done um, by Stanford, which pretty much does the same thing, but the key distinction was um, RDAL uses a regression to, class to, um, to determine the values of the pixels. Um, so you can see a bunch of the colors are actually washed out, so it doesn't pick up the green. It kind of averages the colors and doesn't they don't really pop out. Um, what the Stanford paper does is they actually define uh, this as a classification problem. So it forces the classifier to choose a, a color, so they actually get brighter tones. Um, yeah, so combining these two features, uh, we went ahead and picked our data set which is MIR Flickr 250,000, oh, 25,000 uh, images, um, about three gigabytes. Um, there are a lot of varied pictures, um, and they're also picked from the more, Flickr has an interestingness rating, and these are actually the, the more interesting ones. So that makes for a very challenging set, I guess, to train on the neural network. It'll get a lot of information from that. Um, yeah. So what we did is we actually had a pipeline where we we decided to do the image processing in MATLAB. Um, and one of the things we noticed reading the papers was a lot of the space, a, a lot of the papers don't use RGB um, for a few different reasons. But the, the main ones being um, RGB has three color channels and they'd rather just train two. Uh, a lot of the HSB space, um, lab space, only have two color channels. So, of course, it's easier to train two channels as opposed to three. Um, yeah, and there were an, an other few reasons, but that one's probably the, the most compelling one. Um, yeah, so in MATLAB, basically what we did is we transform uh, our picture, which is um, RGB, so three color channels, and we... Uh, instead take it to lab, which is L for lightness, which is basically the intensity, uh, A and B, which is basically the two color channels. Um, yeah, and that's what we do. Um, we also based our design of the neural network on, so yeah, neural network, there we go, uh, VGG16, which is a, an image classification CNN. Uh, so it originally was made to, I think there's a version of 10 classes and another one of 100 classes, but it basically just takes an image and spits out uh, probabilities for 1 to 100 classes and takes the highest one, and that's what you get. Uh, so we actually took it and modified it uh, to actually suit our needs. So here's a picture of what VGG is like. Uh, and the key contribution from Dow's paper was he adds these other links to um, he takes the outputs of the of the VGG16 and then further feeds them into a parallel branch uh, and at the end of that you just get the output um, color channels uh, so yeah so we modified this neural network uh, we we did this in Keras by the way which is uh, which is actually pretty easy to to build your architecture layer wise so it's very good at linking and building layers. Um, yeah, and the key point was the VGG16 takes in, uh, because it's made to work with RGB pictures, it takes a 3 by 224 by 224 
uh, image. Uh, so we modified it. We feed it basically the black and white intensity channel concatenated two times. So it's a three. It's a single channel three times, basically. Uh, yeah. And then we train that, and at the end we get the output. Uh, we get the two layers. So two by two two four by two two four. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so in MATLAB, what we basically had to do was uh, crop the picture, uh, then scale the picture, then convert from RGB to lab space. Uh, and then what they do is, because it's a classification problem, um, instead of actually having the intensity value of, let's say, a single array of a 2x4x2x4, by four by two by four, uh, the neural network outputs, uh, let's say we have the 50 classes, it would need one... The, the output layer would be 224 by 224 by 50 for a single color channel. So we needed to discretize the, the pixel values uh, of the 256 values, um, bring them down from to a range of 1 to 50, and then do the one-hot representation across that dimension. So we actually went from 224, 224 times 2, and then we inserted the, the 50 uh, bins we needed to classify, to obtain the, the right dimensions to classify the the image. Um, yeah, and basically we had one MATLAB script that did this and took the RGB into this format that we fed into the, uh, the neural network, and then we had another one that undid the process and, and allowed us to take out uh, the output of the neural network and reconstruct the image. Um, so that's it for our pipeline, basically. Um, let's see... Yeah, so this is a bit of the, I won't be covering this, but it's, uh, anything else? Yep, and that's it pretty much. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Amory Kong, and I'll be covering the backend and big data portion of our image colorization project. So after the image processing portion, uh, we now have a bunch of MATLAB data files, which are consisting of the feature vectors, which are the grayscale values of our images, or the L components in the LB color space. Our target vectors are the bin color values from those images, or the AB components. So the next step we have is to move everything to our AW uh, image, where we can do our big data work. The first part of our big data pipeline is to store all of our MATLAB generated files in a easily accessible format. So due to the large amount of data we're working with, we can't use normal methods to store these, such as lists or uh, arrays. So instead, we use uh, e arrays from the pi tables module. This array type is both compressible and extendable, so we are able to write our data to the disk and append and read them as we need. Uh, the e arrays are stored as hierarchical data format HDF5 files, which are a, which is a file format optimized for efficiently storing and managing high volume data. So here's a screenshot of our initialization parameters for the e arrays. Um, so as you can see, we need to specify the dimensions beforehand. So we uh, input the shape of each feature and target vector, as well as the expected number of data points. The next step is to incorporate our modified VGG16 uh, neural network into the Apache uh, Spark platform. Using uh, the Elephas module, uh, we are able to run distributed deep learning modules at a large scale on Spark. Um, Elephas works by initializing a master Keras model on a master driver and then handles the serialization and segmenting of an input data set to his workers. So the model is sent uh, to each worker along with a chunk of data to be trained, and then the results are sent back to the master driver, which aggregates the results from all workers to create a final model. So this is a GIF uh, showing this uh, process. So as you can see, the parameters uh, are sent to each data and model worker, and the updates are sent back to the master model to be combined. Um, it's worth noting that Elephas works primarily with the uh, Sparks RDDs, so we can have to convert our uh, HDF5 files in order to proceed. Um, RDDs are an immutable data structure, and they are structured such that it is divided into mar uh, multiple partitions. Uh, these partitions may then be operated on with different nodes of our computing cluster. And while, uh, while uh, the HDF5 and the ERA file formats were really useful beforehand in managing uh, our large and constantly changing data sets, um, RDDs were optimal for read-only, parallelized uh, compute operations with a focus on the much faster in-memory processing. So that's what we use from for the rest of the pipeline. So next, uh, we have our weights and our trained model, and then we can load them into 
uh, Python uh, with Keras for colorization step, and then finally into MATLAB to uh, see the output the final image. So now I'll cover the platforms and software packages we used and explain a little bit about why we used uh, what we did. So uh, MATLAB uh, was uh, the main uh, platform for image processing. Um, our project has deep ties with computer vision, so therefore uh, MATLAB's matrix manipulation uh, abilities made it an ideal choice. Um, we use MATLAB for the pre-processing uh, stage, where we read in our images, uh, create the train and test vectors, and for post-processing as well, when we want to view the final uh, output image. Uh, Python was uh, ideal for the overall pipeline and algorithm evaluation. Uh, it has an API with almost everything we used. Um, it's got a lot of libraries, and it's frequent use with distributed deep learning projects uh, made in it an ideal choice for us. Uh, between uh, you know, importing MATLAB data files through uh, SciPy and the PySpark API, uh, we were able to integrate all of our software tools uh, seamlessly uh, with MATLAB. Keras and Theano. Uh, so for neural network development, um, we use Keras for its uh, popular deep learning library. Uh, it's written for Python, and it runs on Theano, which is a popular GPU-friendly mathematical Python library, so they went hand in hand. And then finally, uh, we use Spark for big data manipulation. Uh, uh, Spark is a popular cluster computing engine that we've all used, and it's our platform of choice uh, due to its streamlined API and integration with Python. So here are, uh, is a sample of the results we got from training our model on the Flickr dataset. So from our results, we can see that our classifier, it's, it's working. Uh, it's working to choose the most probable color bin for each image. Um, however, it definitely works better for some images uh, than others. Uh, so plants, for instance, like the top row, uh, are colored pretty well uh, because green is a pretty prominent uh, feature in our, our data set. Uh, so like trees, flowers, they all contribute to this. Uh, we can see that, that the leaves are appropriately colored, and the model guessed that the, the white flowers uh, in grayscale were, had a hint of green, uh, even though they're actually white. It's interesting to note that these 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 buds over here were uh, they, they were colored. I can see specks of uh, yellow and green uh, in in this region uh, as well. Uh, the second row, you see an image of a a beach, and there's a lot of blue and green in the open image. Uh, most of the sky was colored correctly. Uh, there's there's a blue there, uh, and the clouds were also not colored in this region, which is good because uh, white white is a gray soil color, and the sand was mostly misclassified. Um, most, most likely due to the abundance of uh, sky and grass uh, being next to each other, you know, not, not, not as much sand and sky uh, feature sets. So uh, finally, we can see an example of a image that was classified and colored uh, pretty poorly. Um, the sand over here, you can see, is completely ignored, so there's nothing there. And there's like streaks of blue and green on the edges, which shouldn't be there. But uh, on the plus side, there there's some green here, so the trees. So the trees were were colorized properly, and the car is black, the sky is white anyways, so they didn't need that much color to begin with. Uh, in the future, uh, we may repeat our experiment with a broader or more general data set. Uh, as mentioned, the images we worked with were straight from Flickr, so these are generally of, generally of a higher artistic quality than an average photograph. Uh, there were also a, a very high amount of nature and scenery pictures as well, uh, which may have influenced the amount of uh, you know, blues and greens because of the, there's a lot of sky, water, and grass. Uh, additionally, we could stay within these artistic boundaries and simply work with a larger data set. Uh, there was two options when we downloaded the, the data set. There was a massive 1 million uh, grouping, and as well as a 25,000 group uh, data set, which we ended up using for this project. Uh, it would be interesting to take the million, dim million uh, image data set into account and apply it to test using our current model derived from the smaller data set and see how accurate it works. Uh, in terms of features, uh, if we had more time, we'd definitely like to try this again on different color spaces. Um, you know, RGB, LAB, this HSV and YUV as well. And uh, maybe if you repeat the experiment with uh, these different feature vectors, you get better or worse results, but it'd be interesting to, to investigate. Uh, smaller bin sizes as well. So we did use uh, 50 bins for this which meant we had a broad range of colors for each bin. Uh, if we have smaller bins, there's a higher color resolution, which means that it's a higher class problem, as in there's more classes to sort each, uh, each pixel into, but uh, you could potentially get better results if you train your model well enough. So that's it uh, for our presentation. Uh, thank you for listening.